And while you're doing that, I'm going to take a brief second to introduce our session host, which is Joe, uh, Mark Judeman. He's a board member of Arrow's on his second term, finishing up his second term as a board member with Arrow, and is uh, also a member of. Uh, people remind me the name of his his uh, farming ranch. It's just running off my brain at the moment, uh, but he has a, a ranch. Uh, our our family ranch Great. is Canyon Cattle. Canyon Cattle. I forgot. I knew it. Couldn't remember the word Canyon. Canyon Cattle Ranch in Craig, Montana, and also a strong advocate of alternative energy resources uh, with both solar and wind on his on their family ranch. Um, so I'm just going to let Mark take it away and feel free to expand on your biography or background if, uh, as you see fit. Thanks, Mark. Hi, guys. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, um, yeah, indeed, um, we've got solar out at our ranch and a wind turbine that we've had since 2006. And uh, in addition, we, we live in Helena, uh, where we've actually been happy to be here for the last several days. And it's wonderful sunshine, and, and I think our meters are running backwards uh, with this cold weather and uh, sunny days. So very happy to be here. Um, I will say that... Um, I do have, you know, we do have experience, obviously, growing up on a ranch with uh, agriculture, but what really drew me to Arrow when I first joined upon our return to Montana in 2015 um, was the alternative energy aspect of the organization. And so I'm, I'm very pleased to, to lead a discussion today, not only about where we are, what the current landscape is, um, and Arrow's place in it, but where where we should be moving into the future. Uh, and so um, to that end, I do have a presentation uh, that I'd like to share, mainly as prompts for me uh, of discussion points. Um, I think that we will treat this group as a large breakout room. And by that, I mean that I invite people to uh, interject with questions, comments, discussion during the presentation. I've got some prompts in there to, to specifically ask for that, um, but um, I really do want this to be a conversation about Arrow's future. So give me a second to share my screen and then we'll get started. Okay, can I get a thumbs up if people are able to see that? Excellent. So, um, yeah, we're, we're kind of gathered here today to talk about keeping the AE, the Alternative Energy, in Arrow, the Alternative Energy Resources Organization. So this is a conversation about our future. Robin, in Today's earlier session 11 gave a very nice summary about Arrow's creation story. Uh, and I think the essential item of that, or the, essence, the essence of that, uh, and there are people here that can speak more clearly to that, is that Arrow formed as a group that could provide the positive alternatives to the negative forces of, of fossil fuels in Montana in the early 70s. So we weren't so much against something as we were for something better. And I think that that's really important, um, an important heritage as, as we move forward. In 2017, uh, prior to the expo in Butte, uh, we held what we called an energy summit. Um, there were participants from um, several, I, I should say more than several, many organizations involved in renewable energy in Montana. Arrow was there, MEIC was there, um, Montana Renewable Energy Association, um, Northern Plains Resource Council, uh, on and on. Um, from Arrow's point of view and holding that summit, the question was, 
what is Arrow's role in the Montana renewable energy landscape? And the answer that came back from that summit was that Arrow has a leading role at the intersection of renewable energy and agriculture. Because we have strengths in regenerative ag and because we have strengths in, in renewable energy and alternative energy, um, we could really make a contribution by focusing on where those uh, intersect. Um, the question for us um, over the, since 2017 and, and today and into the future is, what does that mean in actual execution? Um, I totally endorse Arrow's focus on the local food system. That is definitely, clearly, strongly a need uh, as has been shown by uh, the current events of, of this uh, pandemic landscape. But I think that it's also clear uh, and has always been in our framing that uh, to have a um, successful and robust local food system, you need to reduce your inputs. And on one side, that's the fertility inputs and the other, it's the energy inputs. And so we're all totally aligned on that moving forward. And by us, I mean, at, at least the board and the staff. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Montana's current renewable energy landscape. Uh, and, and I'm hoping to, to get uh, some discussion from you all about how you see the landscape as well. Um, these are my observations, and, and so they may, may be limited by uh, what I see, and, and I think that there are folks here that see a lot further than I do. Uh, my first point is that renewable energy, uh, especially solar, has been mainstreamed. Um, unlike the early days of, uh, of Aero, um, you know, it's it's relatively easy in, um, at least in larger communities in Montana, to have solar installed on your home. Uh, it was easy for us to get it uh, put in as ground mount systems at our ranch. Uh, that was certainly not the case in, in 1974. It's also true as, uh, you know, I guess maybe uh, kind of as a result of that, uh, or uh, synchronously with that, that organizations like the Montana Renewable Energy Association um, have renewable energy as their primary focus. Uh, and um, in many ways, they are able to address policy uh, and lobbying issues around alternative energy better than Arrow can. Uh, they have more capacity and more subject matter experts, perhaps, than, than we do. Um, a third trend, I think, is that utility scale wind and solar are not only viable now, um, but when they are put in place, they are the low cost generators compared to um, not only fossil fuels like coal, um, but, but uh, existing nuclear as well. Several communities in Montana have committed to clean energy goals. Uh, we were involved here in Helena last year in passing a, a resolution at the city council to achieve 100% uh, clean energy by 2030. Um, I believe that Bozeman has a similar commitment I think that Missoula led on that commitment. Uh, and I think other communities in Montana uh, are also considering that. That, by the way, is, is difficult to achieve, um, especially if you are part, if your community is served by um, Northwestern Energy. And so 
that is um, is something that um, needs is is currently being addressed um, by those communities, but it's it's going to be a heavy lift. Uh, bills to expand renewable energy have struggled at the Montana legislature. Uh, we were actually involved a little bit in in some hearings uh, at. Uh, I guess it was the session four years ago, uh, as well as, as the last session, um, trying to establish um, community solar, for instance. And there was a lot of opposition to that. And that bill did not even get out of committee. Montana's Public Service Commission has generally not been supportive of renewable energy, with some exceptions. And so this means that, you know, expansion of, of renewable energy has, has been difficult. Are there any other observations from, from folks on this call regarding uh, the current renewable energy landscape? The, Max? You, uh, my comment is utility perspective. Northwest Energy uh, in the past has been think res somewhat resistant to renewable, claiming that the net metering, the net metered customers are using their lines to make money for themselves. I know I haven't heard the latest what their position is, but I don't think they're supportive of it. Uh, another question, I know they're concerned about the fact that wind and solar are intermittent not available at night. My question is to have the hydro dams and if, is there any program where they, are the dams the, the battery? You know, is it instantaneous? People need power. The dams can automatically let more water through and pick that up. I know their concern has always been solar and wind are intermittent. We have to supply power all the time. Are the dams kind of act as a battery or counter, contradict their statement? I, I could address that a little bit. Um, our family ranch is actually along the Missouri River um, downstream of Holter Dam. And at one time, um, or for many years, um, the dams were kind of operated, as you say, where Flows were altered on an hourly basis, I think, to meet peak demand. And um, this resulted in, in a lot of disruption of the, um, of the riverbed and caused problems with fish, fish hatches and, and so on. And so I think there were lawsuits or other pressure to change that operating procedure at least for the Holter Dam on, on the Missouri River. So I, that may be an issue, but you raise a good point, Paul, that uh, there's something called pumped hydro, um, where uh, at night, say, or, or uh, when uh, the wind is blowing and the sun is shining and you have excess energy, you pump water into an upper reservoir, an elevated reservoir, and then when you uh, when those renewable resources are not available, uh, you then let the water flow down through turbines to generate power so that you can uh, then do exactly as you say, use that as a, as a battery. Um, there is a proposal for something called the Gordon Butte uh, Pumped Hydro Project. And I think that's located maybe by Martinsdale. Um, that has that has met um, with opposition, I think, from Northwestern Energy. It's not clear to me why that is. It may be because they would not own it. Um, it I hesitate to say what, what their uh, the reasons are, but, but that is certainly, a, that's a really good idea of, of using large scale storage like that. And, and Montana is a perfect place for it because we do actually have the relief that makes that possible. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna say what 
Paul said, but shorter that you could add to your bullet there that <clears throat> the Public Service Commission and Northwest Energy have not been supportive. <laughs> but one of the questions I have, I don't know if this is a place, probably not the place yet, but to throw it on the table. Um, I mean, it's a mindset thing in my mind, and probably are technical deals for the utility, but uh, particularly as they're phasing out coal, if you put solar on top of all the big box stores in the major towns in Montana and use that, use, put those electrons into the local grid, you could use the major grid to send the, what I would consider our most expensive in cost, namely the coal electrons, which are doing the damage they do so they should cost more, uh, so we don't use them as much, but they could go out to the coast where they spend more money. They, they pay higher for electrons. Of course, they don't want dirty electrons, but there's a mindset there on making that kind of shift. You know, intermittency obviously is an issue, but um, I think it's more of a mindset than the technological and the business models in the way too. And that's, that's a much bigger problem for our culture in general. But um, I like your summary. I think that's really helpful, Mark, the way you've, you know, kind of laid this out. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that actually as late as 2004, it wasn't as easy to get solar at your house or at your ranch. I mean, really in the last 12, 15 years, in the last 10 particularly, this has become a lot, a lot easier, a lot more mainstreamed. I, I can't actually see everyone. So if anyone, you know, just please just jump in if you have any other comments. Thank you, Max. Mark, I'll jump in with a couple here. Um, <clears throat> if I can keep my mind straight, I'm getting zoomed out. Um, you know, you're with the purpose of this being, you know, where's, where's my uh, arrow headed, you know, um, and your summary here, you talk about how MREA is kind of the primary focused organization in the state that's uh, on renewable energy. But, you know, like Max and Paul, and the others are pointing out, there's a long history of Arrow having a lot of influence in this. And I'd hate to see that loss and I'd hate to see uh, Arrow not stay at the table in a way that was really interacting, you know, at all levels, lobbying with the other organizations. Uh, and then it, there is that intersection with the ag uh, aspect of it. So exactly. more of a holistic type of approach or thinking. And we've got some people in, in the group, young, young and older ones, both that have a lot of more than, I mean, I, I'm always impressed by like Andrew Crow and some of the stuff that Wilbur did in the past years and what Max is talking about from all the years that they did stuff and how, you know, just bringing up ideas like putting solar panels on top of a, the box stores, you know, it's not something that people aren't talking about, but uh, it, it, it helps keep education going and keep it in the limelight. So I, I think, uh, I think Arrow still has a role in this, I guess, is the down or the uh, take home for me on this. Thank you, Steve. And, and I could not agree more. Um, I, and I probably should have laid out, you know, kind of my general agenda here. Um, but we are kind of moving to that discussion about what does that role look like moving forward? Um, it's, it's my kind of my academic background that I, I work through things in a stepwise manner here, sorry. You know, I, I've, I can sympathize, Mark, because uh, every time I go to an aero conference, people are always thinking way ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I really appreciate those comments, Steve. Um, I wanted, so if, um, unless there are other comments on, on the last slide, I'm, um, you know, kind of like the current uh, landscape, um, and I do welcome those. I, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about what, um, you know, kind of the macro trends uh, that we're looking at, and um, as we consider again, what Arrow's role uh, might be. Um, so with no further ado, or and unless again, there are more discussion, uh, let me go ahead with those. Uh, I think most people anticipate a continued decline in the cost of renewable energy, um, specifically solar. Um, there is a uh, already beginning a phase out of the personal uh, investment tax credits 
uh, for renewable energy. Uh, so that kind of counteracts to some extent, I guess, the, the decline in cost. Um, we're also seeing, you know, we've seen the tariffs on, on solar equipment and so on, uh, which have impacted the cost as well. Um, I fear, uh, and, and I hope I'm wrong, but I fear that the incoming legislature may be even less supportive of renewable energy than, than we've seen in the past. Uh, and, and may indeed actively work against it. Um, I had great hopes that the Public Service Commission might see its um, composition change in, during the last election, but um, it did not and, and, and maybe has become even um, more solidified in, in, in not being pro-renewable energy. Uh, there is a difficulty in making large scale solar farms economic, economically viable in Montana. Um, and again, I think that's due both to the opposition of the PSC towards renewable energy and um, plus Northwestern energy making it difficult for um, solar farms to, to hook up to the grid in a, in a cost-effective way for the developers. It is also true that um, these communities uh, that have clean energy goals will be looking for clean energy, clean electricity to meet those goals. So that, that may be an area of opportunity. And I will say, you know, maybe one of the intersections of uh, ag and, and ener energy is that for large scale wind farms and solar farms, um, landowners who, who have farms and ranches are, are likely the place where those would be sited. And so that could be an opportunity. What other trends do you all see? You know, I'd like to throw in that the, the, renew, the energy market in general, the whole energy landscape of all types is really volatile right now. And there, there are a lot of people innovating, changing their directions. An example is uh, the oil and gas industries are now getting into geothermal using the drilling technology to drill down deep enough and they've got technical problems yet, but that could actually be a huge game changer in cheap electricity. And electricity that's not as impactive on the landscape as wind and solar. So I don't know that, I think we need to be very agile in whatever we present and, and propose as a group uh, the open-handed thing like Robin was talking uh, where you, you go into this with, you know, let's, let's not cut ourselves off from anything that might really, really be working. Um, I read an article just yesterday that uh, peak oil was 2019 based on the pandemic maybe have resulted in the changes, but it ain't, it isn't going to recover in terms of oil consumption because of the clean energy that's now available and the cheaper clean energy that's now available. So that's, of course, that's in theory and who knows what will really happen. But <clears throat> so when you ask about what trends do I see, I see, you know, having to sit there and just really look and read and study and get get back in the game of, you know, what are the options? What what are the barriers? What, you know, what are, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, I don't really have a head for energy. I'm more farming into things, but in organic. But um, I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that, you know, uh, here we got, you know, things changing really rapidly right now, and there's potential for good things to come out of it. You know, I bought an electric car a year ago, all electric, and I'm sold. And so many people could go that route and make a huge difference on climate and things like that. And 
I think people are actually starting to think that way. I mean, if an older guy like me can go out and buy an all electric car and just get all excited about it, so can anybody else, you know? I have a question. Does, does Arrow do any a lobbying or legislative work? With, with the legislature meeting, was Arrow going to do any promoting of bills or introducing bills? Um, uh, oh, Robin, is that you? That is me. Go, Go ahead, on. and then I'll follow up. Okay. Uh, I would I would say so so the short answer is no we haven't we are not prepared to do that um, the long answer is we don't currently have the capacity to do that um, both financially and you know um, member engagement wise to do it I I think that that is a gap uh, and and I certainly would like to see us with an engaged membership and with the you know the financial resources to do so, to to re-enter that uh, that role. And then I'll jump in here and say that oh I missed something. Let me try this again. Sorry, hang on. One second. I can't talk and type. Uh, yes. So. To, in support of that effort, though, Paul, uh, one of we have an upcoming session next Wednesday um, at Expo, which is an opportunity to hear from uh, two representatives uh, in the state legislature. Um, I know there's, yeah. So Christopher Pope and Marianne Dunwell are going to be talking about their perspectives of uh, what the um, impacts of the new administration are going to be on renewable energy systems in the state in terms of policies and opportunities uh, and, in, and in terms of any regulations and policies we may want to be protecting. And they will also be talking about um, ways in which people can engage and support the process. So I highly recommend you participate there because they're gonna be our support in trying to get that information out to the community. We've also asked Andrew Valinas from MREA to join and share how MREA is going to be um, supporting and, and how people can engage together with MREA in any way that will you know, keep us Keep, help keep our fingers on the pulse of what's happening there. So uh, that is what we can do and are doing at the moment. I know an idea, I mentioned it to Marianne Dunwell a while ago. It's what they do in Utah, that if there is excess energy produced on one of the net metering systems, that, that it, profit, rather than just going to the utility, goes into a fund for low income energy assistance. I know we put on a, a solar system, PV system a couple of years ago, and I wanted to make sure we didn't size it too large because we didn't want any excess. And our true update is April 1st. I didn't want to donate that to Northwest Energy. I know our son in Bozeman put on a large system, 8KW, thinking he was going to get an electric car. He didn't. So every year he do donates hundreds of dollars to Northwest Energy. I don't know how many people do that, but if there was a bill that said any of that excess rather than be profit for Northwest goes into a fund for low income energy assistance. She said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. So I don't know whether they will if she will write something up, but I don't know how big it is, you know, if it's just a couple thousand dollars, but if it's tens of thousands of dollars, it might be something for us. We would have thought, well, we'll probably go a little, we'll build a little bigger knowing that it's, we're not giving it as a profit, but we'll use it. It'll be three, four years before we get an electric car. But that's a bill that she may introduce. I love that idea. Um, an alternative is it goes into a fund that improves broadband in the state of Montana. <laughs> oh, 
help get us up to, you know, we're 50th in the state apparently in rural broadband. Yeah. Robin, are, are there any notes in the chat that I'm missing? Uh, no. Uh, well, have you seen this note from Carl just talking about his comment that Northwest Power is not particularly happy with net metering? Oh, from um, for Yes. And he says he's installing a solar net metered in Livingston and they're, they're only willing to let him earn whatever he spends so that the goal of the system will be a net zero, no earning money, according to the engineer who did the utility install. Rob Byron is uh, going to weigh in on Paul's comments. Um, uh, I mean, certainly in the next few years, we're going to see a lot more uh, solar and wind go in, especially in especially solar in Montana at the residential level. So even if there's not a huge uh, fund there now, there probably will be more, uh, especially given that Montana is so unfriendly to to residential solar. Um, the, uh, so your idea is great because that, uh, if the bill could get introduced, that is hard for even very conservative uh, legislators to go against because it benefits everybody. Um, uh, so that, that would be great if that some bill like that could come in or if Marianne and one of the others could put it in. The other thing I was going to mention, which many of you may be aware of, and I don't know how many members of Aero are uh, more rural and not on Northwest Energy, but there is a lot of funds available for uh, electric co-ops to do things for their members, uh, which can include things like solar and others. Um, but it's up to the individual co-op to to uh, kind of jump through the hoops to get that money. But there's a substantial amount of money sitting there available for co-ops nationwide to do that. Thank you, Rob. Uh, it, it does occur to me, uh, you know, when I'm when I'm talking about these, uh, you know, these trends here, that um, they really are focused kind of like on the renewable energy side of things, rather than the, the larger topic of alternative energy, which might include things like, um, uh, you know, energy efficiency and conservation in, in homes and um, the sort of things that John Brown's involved with, with uh, um, season extending greenhouses that, you know, use geothermal energy and so on. So um, please, please see that I may have a blind spot for some of those things. And, and if you see that blind spot, um, bring it up. The other, the other thing I think I, I probably could have added to the list here is what's happening at the national level. Um, you know, there may be with the new administration coming in in, in January, um, more support for renewable and alternative energy um, than we're currently seeing. And, and so that may be a trend. I, that's a trend that I hope to see. You know, Mark, are you building, and I know that these are gonna be available on the website, right? These, these sessions. Yes. So what you guys have done is great because your people can come back and look. Um, and I don't know if you'll do any editing, like I guess you probably won't, but like with your slide. Um, but you know, a lot of the utility uh, obstruction, it, it, part of it's their business model. Um, you know, the, the tie in with coal, they're not really driven by what's the most effective way to produce, provide energy for the state. They're just, you know, they have their little system. The other big, the other big things, the grid, and I'm not as smart about it. Paul, you might know more about it than I do, but back 10 years ago, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, how, how we as a nation manage the grid and, and our particular local grid and, and that affects how we do long range transmission lines out of the state with wind. 
I think at Arrow, we're more concerned about just providing energy here, not making renewable energy a commodity to sell to somebody else, which is a whole, you know, mindset thing for the culture, really, extractive versus uh, more sustainable. But I'm guessing that there are, you know, the energy industry has tried to scare us that the more people that get solar and get off the grid is going to make the fewer and fewer people paying for the grid and we won't be able to support the grid, you know, which like all infrastructure gets old and needs to be renewed. I think there's a really interesting conversation there from a systems point of view, but um, it's a little bit outside immediate policy discussions. It's more long range. And I don't know if anybody in the Aero team even understands that issue and knows how to even get be part of it. <laughs> But I think if there is somebody thinking creatively about it, I'd like to know about it. And maybe Errol could point us in that direction. Max, I'll look at our list of attendees from that energy summit in 2017. Uh, I think there may be, I can't remember what it's called, Northwestern Renewable Energy Coalition or something like that. That may be- Yeah, I think the coalition was more in tune with that. And I don't know where they're at today, but it, yeah, I, you know, I think we talked about it at the last session of, to the extent Arrow can can uh, be a bridge to those other organizations, so that the Arrow members can have access to what their discussions are, rather than us trying to do it, could be helpful to us. And I might help us when we're up at the legislature, you know, talking to legislators to have a little more ammunition to kind of push back against the utility and the PSC. Right. And I, I know that uh, in some places there are uh, efforts to integrate solar farms with food farms. And I'm wondering if any of that is, uh, is going on here where either, you know, one of the simpler ones is running sheep underneath the um, photovoltaics and the other, one that uh, would be, since it's already fenced, deer fenced, it's already, you know, really contained. It seems to me like it would be a place, uh, and the land is already owned. Uh, that um, small vegetable uh, operations, or or even seed, uh, <clears throat> would be a good option for that that space it's got shade it's got you know there's some wind mitigation because of it and uh probably some turbulence as well but um seems like that that would be a, a place to go especially if they're somewhat private <coughs> and and uh, that private person could um you know, i don't know what the discussion is going on around that Really good points, John. Um, and, and we heard it I, in, in one of the earlier sessions in this expo, uh, we saw a recording presented by Andrew Alanis from MREA um, from their summer series that they had recorded um, with somebody from NCAT uh, talking about agrisolar, which is, as, as you've suggested, a right. way to combine agriculture and solar um, so that you can get the benefits of both. And I actually have that on, a, on the next, I think it's the next slide after this one. So if you all don't mind, I'll, I'll move ahead. Um, Robin, if, the, if any, I can't see any, everyone, if anyone is raising their hand or anything, please let me know or, or call on them. Okay. Oh, so actually, um, my bad, uh, Coulter just put in a comment and he said he has, he has a few questions. In alternative energy in Montana, are rocket mass heaters allowed by code? It has been accepted into the Portland Building Code. Second, is straw bale building able to be financed? I know in Canada, they have found straw bale to be a superior structure from an insurance point of view. And lastly, using local straw as a building resource would be great to reduce the carbon footprint of the standard house as well as reducing as reduced heating requirement. So 
code, requ uh, code considerations for rocket mass heaters and straw bale uh, for insurance purposes. So I think uh, at the Missoula Expo, we had somebody talking about rocket mass heaters. Um, and my understanding at that time was that uh, they were not allowed by code. So most of the installations were uh, you know, off grid uh, or, or in non incorporated uh, jurisdictions where, where there might not be any building codes or whatever at all. But um, I, I will say that I'm not an expert on that. So if, if anyone else has more information than that, uh, I'd be interested to hear. Uh, regarding straw bale, um, Robin, I, you know, the, um, the straw bale house that was built at um, Russ and Elsie's, uh, I don't know if that was financed or if that was, you know. I'm sure it was not financed. Yeah. Uh, so these are great questions. Uh, somebody should be able to answer them. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, Let's I'm going to write them down. Yeah, let's keep those and make sure that we capture the, the chat because I think these are really um, good ideas. Uh, this is, there is sections of the code that says alternative methods are allowed. So it's up to the individual building code jurisdiction. I know one of the questions had been years ago, it was electrical. You know, how do you run wires through the and it's allowed. It, it depends on the inspector, but there is a section of the code that says alternative methods must be allowed. So it's up to the code jurisdiction. I know many of them have been built in side city limits. So I guess the financing would be up to the bank. That would be the question, but I think they're within the code. Cool. Thank you, Paul. Uh, okay, real quick. Uh, just kind of... Mark, I, I was muted. That reminds me that uh, our state building code is once again up for uh, refiguring, and, and that might be, I don't know, Jim Berg, who was very active in the last one, is, is a, has been an Arrow member in the past. I don't know where he is today, but it'd be interesting if nothing else in the newsletter, we could have an update on the status of that, because that certainly could be a place to advance these ideas. Great. Great. Yeah, let's, uh, let's keep that on our list of possibilities for Arrow then as well. Um, I do want to move ahead just a little bit because then I think we'll get into a meteor discussion in, in a minute. Uh, just want to talk a little bit about our current position uh, at Arrow. Um, I just want to be frank that currently we do have limitations of Arrow's resources and capacity, uh, very small staff. Uh, and underpaid staff. Um, we are ag and energy task forces, which, which in the past have been very active, are currently dormant uh, and lacking leadership. Um, so those are those are kind of you know the, the downside aspects. On the on the upside, uh, there is. Um, volunteer participation in the Montana food economy um, uh, effort um, work, uh, which uh, is in direct support of uh, renewable energy or alternative energy uh, and uh, reduction of uh, energy and fertility inputs for, um, for these projects that people may bring forward. Um, you saw in the Expo program, we've had lots of themes regarding uh, renewable and alternative energy, uh, ranging from the MREA uh, videos um, posted by Andrew Galinas that I mentioned. Um, board member Andrew Crow had an excellent uh, presentation um, or excellent session regarding uh, some other alternative energy options for rural and off-grid folks. Uh, so it, it remains a key interest of Arrow. 
And I think there's uh, potential for collaboration with other organizations. Um, uh, Montana Renewable Energy Association is, is one example, but NCAT, uh, the, the National Center for Alternative Technology is, is another possibility as well. Oh yeah, Mark. Yes. Oh, just on that piece with NCAT, uh, I'm hoping you can do a better job of communicating this than I can, but um, they have just, they are in the final stages of receiving, NCAT is, uh, a substantial amount of funding, I think from the USDA, uh, in support of, I think it's solar in installations in agriculture, and um, we have been in contact with them. Well, can you can you do a better job of communicating the essence of that? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's exactly exactly like you're saying, Robin. They're gonna. Um, my understanding is they're gonna form a clearinghouse. That's uh, it. Kind of like a central repository of information or a single contact point for people interested in um, this agri-solar idea that, that John had mentioned earlier. Uh, how how farmers and, and ranchers and other landowners might um, be supported in their in their work to develop um, uh, photovoltaic solar on, on their land. Right, and they're going to be a national clearinghouse. It's not. It's not finished yet. They still have to work out some details, and Aero has already connected with them to um, see if we could support from the Montana angle. Yeah, great. Thank you for bringing that up. Sure. Okay, so so I kind of brainstorm some options for moving forward, and I think this again is where the media the meaty discussion is going to happen for how Aero might move forward. Uh, in keeping alternative energy in the in the arrow name, um, so I've got some discrete options, and then as you see at the end, you know maybe there's some combinations of these that we can discuss as well. And I'm sure that I've missed things, and so um, hopefully, you know, during our discussion, maybe we can bring other ideas forward as well. We're capturing all of these, um, and it'll help us. You know, we're the intent here is to listen to the membership represented by, by you all and find out kind of what your direction, uh, the direction you want to go is, and then um, try to have, you know, this, this again, just like this morning session is the beginning of the conversation on how Arrow moves into the future and what we look like. So some of these options are, um, one is focusing on, on rural and off-grid uh, do it yourself or alternative technology um, as again uh, referencing Andrew's uh, Andrew Crow's um, wonderful presentation and discuss discussion ah, I misspelled expo uh, early earlier in the expo um, so that's um, you know small scale wind small scale solar um, solar thermal um, uh, you know alternative building methods, all sorts of things like that. Um, or we could focus on season extending tech, uh, various forms of, of greenhouses. Um, there are the, what is it? I'm gonna say this wrong. The Walpini, I think is the subterranean greenhouse. Um, there's a greenhouse that John and uh, John Brown here and uh, uh, Bob Quinn have been talking about um, based on a model from uh, a fellow in uh, Nebraska, um, the, <coughs> excuse me, the Northern Colorado Permaculture Center, I think that's what it's called, maybe it's Rocky Mountain Permaculture Center, uh, has been doing lots of work with kind of a similar concept of geothermal passive uh, greenhouses um, where they used uh, some of the heat of condensation when they um, when they cycle air into the, into the ground uh, during the summer, and then they bring it back out in the, in the winter. It gives uh, so, uh, kind of an additional boost to the energy that's available. Um, we could focus on this agri-solar at various scales, uh, from, from small scale for an individual at their home or uh, for a small uh, produce farm or even larger, maybe with commercial developments. We could 
focus on alternative building materials using farm inputs. You know, this is another area of intersection of energy and, and agriculture. Uh, as mentioned, straw bale is, a, is an alternative, there is a possibility. Um, hempcrete is something that we've talked about. Um, people are using wool as insulation and it has a lot of properties that work very well for that. One of my first engagements uh, with Aero was to, to support a crowdfunding campaign that they had launched um, to support the Repower Montana website. Um, and I think, I think the intent was that that was gonna be kind of like a database of all the, uh, the solar installations across the state. Um, I don't think that it's, it's my impression is that it hasn't been well sub supported and it hasn't met that goal. But uh, again, maybe we could reimagine it so that it's a resource uh, for everything at the Alternative Energy Ag Nexus. So sort of, the, you know, if, if you want to learn about uh, season extending greenhouses in Montana, maybe that's a place you go. Or if you want to look at alternative technology um, as per Andrew, uh, that might be a, a place to go. Another option is to rebuild the energy task force to um, have a, a more direct line uh, to folks who are uh, practitioners of uh, alternative energy in the field and, and uh, figure out how to, you know, from the grassroots, figure out how to, what the areas of um, focus should be and, and how to communicate that uh, across the, um, the Aero community. Another option might be to engage with those communities who have clean energy goals to see if um, we, and by that I mean uh, the members of Aero or uh, farmers and ranchers who, who might be members can contribute to that, to that effort. So, so I'm curious, um, kind of with that as a preamble, if, if uh, folks have other ideas that, that we should add to this list. Um, Mark, just while folks are gathering their thoughts, I want to read a comment here from Coulter, who just wanted to I recognize that Paul Wheaton is currently building a truly passive greenhouse over in the greater Missoula area, no electricity at all. Sweet. Uh, yeah. So uh, Coulter, I want to mention that uh, Paul Wheaton was the person that presented at uh, the Missoula Expo uh, regarding the, the rocket mass heaters, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. So could we profile that project on our website so people could hear it, learn about it? That would be great. Uh, I mean, I think that's another one, you know, with our limited capacity, that might be something we can do is, is uh, point to things that are happening already in the, in the, in the community. Um, and then I think the challenge is getting more eyeballs on our, I mean, I, I've heard from a number of people that they don't know what Arrow's doing and yet they get an email telling them to look at the latest newsletter or the website and they, or the Facebook page and they don't get around to doing it. And I know this is a social media challenge for lots of organizations, but I think, I think we need to find someone to help us get get more eyeballs to our, I think there's excellent material there. So we need to leverage what we've done. Um, I had a thought about how these, you know, you talk about combinations. Um, so in helping communities with clean energy goals, in my mind, that's more than renewable energy. That, that means not just building codes, but actually encouraging building even how, even neighborhood design or community design that uses less energy and takes advantage of, you know, you make sure you have roofs and passive solar, you don't waste those opportunities. But it also might include things like uh, partnering with uh, Habitat Humanity on one of their houses to make one of their houses be a demonstration straw bale house and have the city involved in that collaboration, maybe even find some funding. Or, uh, or you know, even demonstrating hempcrete. I mean, there could be a demonstration house that showed all these new ideas that are coming down the pike. You know, an arrow might help the city 
and Habitat figure that out. You know, I, I think we're getting good at collaboration, and maybe that's maybe that, that that's an I'd throw that idea onto the list. Um, so those are some thoughts I had. That's that's an excellent idea, Max. I could make a comment about Habitat for Humanity. I'm on the board here in Helena, and Helena Habitat is building houses in Red Lodge. And one of the houses in Red Lodge, it's sponsored by, I think it's whatever the utility company down is in Red Lodge. Co-op, yeah. And, oh, they, they're funding a zero energy home. It'll have all electric. It, it's built with the SIPS panels. They're 10 and a half inch thick foam walls built in Belgrade. Hmm. That is designed to be a zero energy home. What I'm wondering about is working with the different builders organizations around the state is on their parade of homes, if we could co coordinate a zero energy home on the parade. It, it, it certainly it's, it's cost effective. If more people would know, I mean, you could on the parade, you'd go in, you'd see the solar panels, people could display their energy bills. They have an all electric home which is zero, they have zero energy bills, they're net metered and it and have the cost saying that we did this for an extra $10,000. I mean, it's cost effective. If more people knew that, I think it would gain, gain interest just promoting that, that now zero energy with heat pumps is certainly within the realm of most people moving into a new home, if they knew that. Yeah, I, 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 I comment didn't years ago. Arrow would coordinate tour of alternative energy homes. I know it's been a couple of years ago, but the focus was I think off grid. Although not all of them. I know we toured Tarmigan Square here in Helena. The last one I think I attended was seven or eight years ago. Any uh, bringing those back? Three or four years ago, we had a um, in Energy Corps member who is working at Aero, and he is, and his partner had a um, um, organized a tour of both their tiny house uh, as well as some of the solar installations around town here. Um, so it, it's been a, a short time, at least um, since you know within the time that I've moved back here. Uh, but I, I think that's, that is a great idea to, to promote that. Uh, we could also coordinate, you know, each year, the um, American Solar Energy Society and um, I think it's Solar United Neighbors are now putting on the, the National Solar Tour. And so if you wanted to, you know, connect, um, you know, connect it to that National Day of Tours, we could we do something similar. What organization did that? Uh, the alternative, uh, the um, American Solar Energy Society, ASES. And, um, and I think they partnered with um, Solar United Neighbors, um, SUN, um, in the last couple of years to put that on as well. Um, Mark? Yes. I am going to put something else in the chat box here along the lines of this dialogue. You, I don't know if folks know this, but um, uh, NCAT did not get the Energy Core uh, program has been discontinued. Uh, and uh, Steve Thompson, who is the executive director of NCAT, is actually and was on Montana, the uh, uh, Governor Bullock's Community Re Climate Solutions Council and developing the Climate Solution Plan for Montana uh, is working on exploring the possibility of putting together what he what he's calling a resiliency core, uh, sort of as the next generation of energy core participation through the Vista program this time, and he is going to be talking about that 
on Thursday, December 10th at Expo. And the registration information is there. It's from 1 to 2.30 on December 10th. Really, and he's actually wanting to have feedback from folks on, um, he's kind of doing, would like to do an, a needs assessment to confirm that, to be able to demonstrate the value of of this resiliency core at, at sort of the nexus of the alternative energy resources and climate solutions that seem to be, you know, uh, coming together in this time of uh, greater understanding of the impacts of climate change in our community level and the opportunity for solutions. So I just wanted to put that out there. Any other suggestions for, for options, Pereira? Um, <clears throat> one of the things that's been on my radar quite intensely lately is uh, the ecosystem restoration camps that are popping up around the world. Um, and it seems like that might be something that would fit into a resiliency core um, model. Um, um, I know I've been John Dennis Liu, who's been, who headed the ecosystem restoration camp, is <clears throat> they started th three and a half years ago with the plans for one camp in Spain. Uh, and then uh, after the campfire um, fire in uh, in California, another one popped up there. And then since then there have been, there's a total of 35 or 36 of them around the world now <clears throat> where people come together to restore ecosystems that have been damaged from one way or another, whether it's been you know, fire or whether it's been earthquake or whether it's been degradation uh, of agricultural practices or whatever. And, uh, and they're really, really amazing places. Uh, and I know that there are you know, several places in Montana that could qualify for uh, to be one of those uh, camps. Uh, I just had to throw that out there because I think it's such a, such a great idea and people are actually doing it. And it's a place where uh, and a lot of pe young people are actively engaged in those and, uh, and, and young people who have been despondent about climate and economy and things has brought hope back into their lives and actually participating in doing something that they feel they can contribute to a better, better world. Thank you, John. I don't know if there's something that Arrow could be involved in, in uh, <clears throat> uh, coordinating something like that, or uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, that, but I think there's some thinking and conversation that could go on around that. Too. Great. You know, Mark, I can see that fitting with uh, Steve Thompson's Resiliency Corps, what John's just talked about. <clears throat> but I'm seeing a couple of points here where is that uh, I think a lot of our energy was, would be best spent uh, coordinating with some of these other groups. I know like you, one of your bullet points is reimagine, repower Montana, but you know, I think that might, I remember that website and <clears throat> It had a lot of potential, but it would be, it was gonna be difficult to maintain, I thought. But NCAT already has a, a uh, system that deals, you know, and they're widely known nationwide. They dispense a lot of information like that and more of a clearinghouse appropriately than maybe we would be. Um, but, you know, Arrow can feed into a lot of those things. And uh, like the city of Missoula's uh, plan for <clears throat> clean energy or zero net, net zero is, have they put together a task force of some pretty, pretty well, you know, people that are really far along in that, and we could somehow um, 
network with them, I think, uh, as you're suggesting, I think that is a positive, uh, easy to do type of thing for Arrow. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Is any comments from folks who haven't um, uh, engaged in the conversation um, previously? I uh, want to make sure that your voices are heard if you'd like. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> Mark, thanks. Um, I've been uh, trying to work on several fronts here uh, in and out. Um, I guess um, I just want to know that I, I hope that our efforts will rejuvenize Arrow and that I'm really looking for younger people. I, I think this has not been to our advantage in terms of having to do this by Zoom because in the past number of years, our annual expo has brought out very, very many young people that have exuded a lot of energy and we're missing a lot of those people. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not certain how we connect with them, but I think we need them. And I think that's the challenge or a challenge that we have right now is how do we engage those people? How do we empower them with um, leadership roles in moving forward. Um, you know, I look at Max and, and uh, Paul and Steve and myself, John Brown, you know, and Will Snack. We're getting, we're getting up there. <laughs> and I, I, I want to, you know, I'd like to be a cheerleader rather than, than, a, than a coach. I, I count myself in that number as well, Gina. Well, okay. I didn't think you were that old. <laughs> I, I do I, uh, just on behalf of Andrew, who is our our young board member. In he's in that precisely that demographic you're referring to, and he unfortunately works on Saturdays, and so was unable to participate in this call. Otherwise, he would be here. But but Aaron is here. And, and Aaron is here, that's right. And, and um, thank you, Aaron, for prescribing, uh, taking notes on this conversation as well. Aaron, do you have anything to offer from your perspective? Um, it, it's, it's kind of hard to say. From my perspective, as a young person who just doesn't have a whole lot of resources right now, um, it's... I think the biggest barrier for getting more young people involved in Arrow is just that, you know, we're, we have all the energy and we want to be engaged. We just need something to do. Um, you know, I can't afford land somewhere. So it like, if I had projects facilitated by Arrow that I could work on, um, we could really increase Arrow's uh, potential and engagement with younger people. Um, I think we just, it would be useful if Arrow had like a really clear message and just like really actionable projects that people could work on. Um, so using Arrow's connectivity to provide those resources and point people in the direction of actionable projects um, could be really useful for getting more people engaged. I think that's a, those are really good points, Erin, and, uh, and, and I've been kind of excited, I think, about the suggestions that have come forward, like uh, engaging with Habitat for Humanity for, for building a straw bale house or, you know, solar tours and things like that um, might be the kind of projects that, that would engage folks. So uh, those, those points are very well taken. You know, um, what was it? Maybe... Um... Four, maybe four years ago, Arrow was very involved, maybe it was five, in helping Russ Salisbury and Elsie Tusk build a straw bale house um, on their property out of Carter 
uh, down on the Missouri River. And there were a lot of arrow people that showed up there and um, worked in adverse conditions of heat. And uh, some of us nearly got um, stranded there when it rained and, and getting out of uh, up, up, up to the breaks from the bottom ground of Russ's, uh, it's gumbo and it rained. And, and I remember I barely made it up getting out of there. <laughs> it could have stranded a bunch of us. But, um, you know, I, we, we, we used to do things like that, you know, maybe not barn raisings, but, but similar things as a community. And uh, I, I think that's a, that would be something to really target as, and focus on and see if maybe next summer we can pull together, hopefully, uh, a non-COVID um, experience. Great. Yeah. I, oh. Go ahead, Robin. I just wanted, uh, Coulter has communicated something here I want to catch. And he says, I was running a labor co-op in Houston before COVID and I moved back home. But that was exactly the goal, bringing people with desire to learn to projects that needed labor help and bringing that type of approach to aero alternative energy think, uh, could be a huge benefit. Very nice. Sounds like culture is signing up. Maybe that's a place to partner with Habitat Humanity to you know start getting some synergies there. Um, but I think I think that's an important point about creating some, you know, doable, you know, uh, doable, you know, projects that appreciate your comments, Aaron. And I think that I think a lot of us with that kind of focus can show up. It's hard to think about. It's hard to think. It's easier to just do. <laughs> yeah, I I've kind of wondered if you know if if. Bob Quinn is moving ahead with his greenhouse. If there might, if he might um, welcome or, uh, you know, a bunch of arrow folks. You and John are talking about that on next week or on Thursday. Yeah. yeah I'll him. bring that up for sure. <clears throat> I mean, that, that is one of my questions because uh, I want to be involved in a hundred of those things. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and I want, wanted to mention, I just got an um, um, email from uh, Joe Clark, uh, who has a, a greenhouse up at his place outside of Kalispell, um, and update on how that's working and uh, stuff. There's some really great information that he's, he's uh, gathering in the construction of his place, and it's more like the one in Colorado, the Jerome Ostentowski one that you were mentioning, uh, Mark. Oh, excellent. Kind of a hybrid. Um, Mark, may I jump in for a minute? Yes, of course. Um, so John Brown asked about, in the, pre in the morning session, I mentioned that uh, Arrow has a bequest of some land in Winifred, which is in Fergus County, in really center, central part of Montana. Um, and he asked for to share a little bit more about that. And so what I can tell you about it is uh, it's land that uh, belonged to, it was a family homestead. It's 195 acres uh, outside of town in uh, Winifred. And um, it's uh, the, Owners of the property uh, um, put it in. A, I don't know what the right word is. I'm sorry. Is you know, it's it's been given to the Nature Conservancy. So, and it's not the Nature Conservancy. Yes, it is. I'm sorry, it's Nature Conservancy. And so, there's an easement on it that limits how it can be um, utilized. So, it can only be used for things like uh, agriculture. You know, you can't build a gas station on it or something crazy like that. But at any rate, um, uh, the, just so that we're all clear, the person who has put this uh, bequest in their will is very much alive. And so it may not come to us for another 20 years. Uh, and 
uh, that's a little bit about it. Maybe, John, if you've got some questions, I could be more specific in my answer. Well, I guess my my curiosity is, is it, is it a place that we that could be um, demonstration projects could be implemented before, uh, you know, while while a person is still alive and see the benefits of what they're bequeathing? Yeah, so that's a great question. And this all came about in December of last year. And uh, that was going to be one of our exploration projects uh, in the winter of 2020. And you know, it's on pause for obvious reasons. Having said that, you know, because uh, it's got, I think, I think there's a lot of, in theory, there's a lot of potential to that. And um, it's pretty far away from a lot of places, you know. Uh, so it would take a little bit of work to figure out how to make it viable and attractive and um, make people want to participate there. That being said, there is a school in, you know, there's a town not too far away. It's a small town, obviously. And there may be uh, resources there for, you know, engaging with the community there to support a demonstration farm in some way. Um, but it, it certainly is worth an exploration and a conversation. And again, at the end of last year, when this was first coming to our attention, the donor, uh, was open to discussion about supporting, developing, you know, providing some funding to support a, that idea and to demonstrate alternative resources uh, through such a, an endeavor. So certainly worth exploring and, and picking up again. I'd like to, to just throw out something that is kind of arrow-like in terms of uh, maybe it's whimsical, uh, maybe it's romantic, what if we combined some project there with a three-day float on the Missouri River to Judas Landing um, from Colbanks Landing, uh, which is a normal put on. And um, Winifred is the first town you would come to on the south side of the Missouri River from Judith Landy. So, uh, you know, maybe maybe there's something that can be leveraged there. I would also add that Bud Barta is nearby in just out of Lewistown. He he might be interested in he's a he's a a builder designer of a lot of really great structures and he was one of the originals of the new western energy show so there's you know maybe maybe we could brainstorm on something like this maybe we should do this on a friday afternoon uh, at a brew pub who knows but that's my thought um i think there's potential okay i, I will say this that you know and, and i'm not suggesting we do it right now clearly because i'm sure folks are like their eyes are spinning with zoom but that being said, these virtual happy hours that we started um, really have been delightful opportunities for engagement. And we, you know, we, it wouldn't take much to invite just a series of evening conversations along these lines to explore any one of these topics. Mm -hmm. and work. Do it once a month, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, that idea, you know, I've been talking along about these, you know, hooking up with other groups, that idea of bringing people back to the farm. The Berry Center is doing that in Kentucky. And again, there, uh, there are models maybe to attract you know, people to a remote place if, if you could define what was gonna happen there and give it, a, give it a, a window. It could be pretty exciting, a good way to engage younger people. Um, definitely, and I guess you're making a list of all these so that you know, as things, as you go forward, you can explore these in a more systematic way, I assume. I, I believe that Aaron is uh, is describing this conversation. So hopefully we've got great, great. Wonderful. Yeah, I have everything written down. And then I would also just like to add that um, even though like we we have a lot of opportunity in these rural places to showcase like larger projects and 
and have um, big engagement. We, we can also do that just, you know, in our own local communities. Um, and I'd encourage anyone who has any land or resources to maybe consider, you know, doing a project on your own land if and uh, getting, uh, letting Arrow provide maybe some of the work or publicity for you to be able to do a project on your own land. Um, just as a demonstration, even if it's just, you know, installing a solar hot water heater or something, I think we could get a lot of support and local interest from just small projects like that. Good idea. Paul? Well, is Arrow going to sponsor a fun run again this year? I know, I think the last one was pretty successful. We had a booth there, quite a few people attended. I would like I'd be curious. I think they, the Fun Run has funded several PV installations. I think the library is one. Uh, but if they would have a display of what has been installed and how it's producing, that would be of interest. And if Arrow has any thoughts of having a booth at county fairs uh, with the uh, 4F, 4H programs, but are you going to do the fun run again? And hopefully they will consider the Habitat Restore again. I know they they approached the Habitat for Humanity it's about five or six years ago. And I think if they came back again, the Restore would like a solar system. But Paul, I, I, I believe it's the Sweeping Giant Citizens Council. Uh, yes, it is. Northern, Northern Plain. Oh, OK, it's not Arrow. That's right. No. Right. I thought it was. But, but they, they should be, there's, there is overlap that has been talked about today, too, with that. Mm. Yeah. Um, and with, I, mean, I think the COVID is just <laughs> this huge cloud that makes things like that, like people don't want to be running with masks. And um, so, um, I think that's a real possibility. And it was, it's been in September, I think. Um, yes. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, well, they, the, do. the council, they did, they are, they are talking about what to do instead and stuff. They're pretty actively exploring that. Good. Um, uh, could I mention one more thing? Um, Coulter has, you know, mentioned the labor co-op. Um, in Houston, uh, when, when we lived in Houston, I was involved with a group called Transition Houston. And one of the things that we did was something called perma blitzes, where we would use permaculture to, to transform people's, usually their yard. Sometimes we have larger projects. And by volunteering for one of those, then you were kind of put in a, um, a draw list for a future perma blitz project. So that might be some, you know, a structure that could also be employed for the, for the kind of work that we're talking about here. And I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted somebody. So please go ahead. Oh, that's Robin. I was just going to uh, read uh, a communication from Coulter. Uh, he said he's got 21 acres between, this was responsive, I think, to Aaron's communication. He says, I have 21 acres between Bozeman and Livingston and would be willing to put in a lot of projects and I'm not that far away. Aaron says, that would be excellent. Love to hear more plans and help out. And uh, uh, Coulter has put, put his phone number and communication in there if folks hey. wanna pursue that with him. Okay. I have a question for Aaron. Uh, when you were, when you, we asked you for your, your ideas earlier, uh, you know, you talked about how few resources, you know, your lim limited resources and what you can do and stuff. I, you know, asking young people just to go out and volunteer all over the place is, is, is good, but do you, it seems to me like, you know, the Energy Corps people were funded, the VISTA volunteers were funded. It seems like we need some money into this, some, some, you know, some kind of capital or some funding to help young people get into these projects on a more, on a scale that gives them uh, some, more benefit from it. Uh, just not just a thought, I guess. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, for sure. I guess I'm, I'm kind of out of really transitional phase in my life. So I'm not like thinking that far ahead. 
But I think for just like establishing more of a base for Arrow and getting more people involved so that, you know, those resources could really get put to work. Um, you know, just starting with like small projects to get people out and volunteering would be really helpful. Um, but I definitely agree that we need some more structural support for those projects moving forward. Folks, we're just about it, out of time. I wanted to show this last uh, slide, which kind of maybe relates to that um, a bit, uh, at least with respect to Arrow. And, and you know, maybe, maybe Arrow can kind of be a um, distribution point for some of those resources. Um, we do have critical need for financial resources. Um, and I know that uh, many of you on this call are already financial contributors, but I just wanted to, you know, encourage people to, to support this organization uh, if you can. And, and I also realize with the COVID that, you know, it's, um, it's a difficult time for lots of people. So, uh, you know, totally understand if, if that's not something that's possible. Um, and then the second, second critical need is engaged membership. Um, and I've got to say that I'm really encouraged by this discussion today. These are, um, this has been a very engaged conversation and wonderful ideas that have come forward. Uh, and, and so um, as, as Robin said earlier today in uh, the 11 o'clock conversation, this is the start of the conversation. Uh, and I think that um, uh, that same thing applies to this, but um, maybe we've got a few action points that we can take um, about how to proceed. And uh, um, I wonder if people who are interested in participating in further planning um, with a focus on action rather than just talking um, might um, maybe put your names in the chat or, or some in some other way, communicate with us your interest in doing that. Robin, Mark, would, you, would you be, well, I'm just wondering if you, you would be open to them communicating with you or? <clears throat> yes, yes, I would. And I'll put my, my email in the chat. And my phone number. My phone number with the caveat that if I don't recognize the call, I may not pick up, uh, or the number I may not pick up. So please leave a, a voicemail if I don't. Does, does this sound like a, a good um, stopping point for everyone? Do we feel like uh, we're kind of, kind of complete? Like we've made some um, some good progress on the issue of what alternative energy at Aero looks like moving into the future. Yep. I got to get off, but I appreciate. It. I think it's been a good focus. I appreciate Mark the way you focus the uh, discussion, and I. I think I think we do just need to keep talking about seeing what what lands and what people have energy for. I think there's a lot of up, there's a lot of a lot of different potential items out there. I think so. Uh, thanks, thanks you guys for doing this. I got to get off. See ya. I've got to go. I've got to go too. But thank you. It's been interesting. I, yeah. Thanks, folks. Thank you all. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Good night. Thanks, Mark.